Welcome, everyone. I'm Sue Barber, author, former IT director for a Fortune 500 company, turn executive coach, and this is the Visibility Factor Podcast, where we explore how to raise your visibility and play bigger at work and in life. We'll explore key topics and welcome guests that help you shift your thinking about yourself so you can see new possibilities for your leadership. I'm on a mission to create a visibility movement for leaders to show their value and be seen for their true talent. Are you ready to take the next step towards a higher level of visibility for yourself? Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Visibility Factor podcast. This is Sue Barber, your host. I am so excited today to introduce you to Nicole Wire. She is a coach and she's an author. And I'm going to let her do an introduction of herself to you, and then we'll get into some great conversation. Nicole, welcome to the show. Good afternoon, Sue. So excited to be here with you and with your listeners on the Visibility Factor. My name is Nicole Wire. I'm the founder of Root to Rise Coaching, and I'm a burnout prevention and recovery coach. That might sound like a really interesting group of people that I work with. And that journey of working with this specific group came from spending 22 years in education. I loved being a dean of students. I loved being a school administrator. And at the same time, I started to notice a theme in lots of conversations around different leadership tables, around working all the time and being really tired and always having conversations about culture and turnover and retention. And we were asking all kinds of really good questions, but it felt like we, were, we missed asking the one most important one, which was, what is our role as leaders in shaping this culture. So I spent a lot of time helping to bring in speakers for professional development at different kinds at different institutions that I served. And I realized that we needed someone to come in who really understood what it was like, who understood some of the challenges of leadership, who understood some of the dynamics of education and the ebb and flow of the academic year. And so I walked out of the dean's office walked into into entrepreneurship. And interestingly enough, as soon as I did that, I discovered that educators are not alone and school leaders are not alone in this quest for working all the time and that propensity to kind of run ourselves into the ground. So I really specialize with folks who are leading and doing well, but who are also understanding and realizing that they're getting a little bit tired and starting to wonder if it's sustainable. So that's a little bit about what I do and excited for this conversation around visibility and how we show up for ourselves and also to talk a little bit about a book that I'm part of that just came out. I am excited to talk about that too. So Nicole and I got a chance to to chat uh, before we're recording the podcast and you have such an interesting background, you know, all of those years in education. I'm curious, how do you see education now from when you first entered that as a profession to where it is now? That is a really good question. Um, I had stepped away prior to COVID. I actually circled back for one year during COVID. And I think that still being in a pandemic and the experience of a pandemic for the entire world has really put some really has put some big questions in front of all of us. How do we gather? How do we learn? How do we teach? Um, How do we work? And I think it's created an opportunity, truthfully, to do some pretty big rethinking about education and teaching and learning. Technology plays a really big role in that. And I think definitely in the United States, one of the things that we have seen that's been amplified and really in the spotlight since, since COVID has been this digital divide. And it's this interesting piece of We rely on technology, and yet we make an assumption that everybody has access to it and everybody doesn't. So I think there's an interesting opportunity to really rethink assessments, grading, college entrance, how we teach and how we learn based on what we've been through in the past three years. My hope is that institutions are asking themselves those questions because simply trying to go back to what we've always done may not be the best for student learning and faculty retention and school culture. Wow, 100% agree. I just think there's so many changes that education has gone through over the years. And now companies are even saying, you know, we don't even know that we require, for example, college education. We might be okay with you getting a certificate or 
we might actually pay for that certificate for you. So it's changing a lot of dynamics in what we as a culture were probably used to around education. Well, and isn't that an exciting piece too? Because I think it's it's holding up that mirror for so many people to say your path to work and to success is high school high school diploma, you know, undergraduate degree and some kind of a graduate degree. And at the same time, there are other ways to gain expertise and develop skills. And the path for everyone isn't higher education and it isn't graduate school after that. And that doesn't diminish anyone's ability to contribute and have purpose and do meaningful work. So I think it's also created this opportunity to say, hmm, let's think about what training looks like and let's try to make it more accessible. I love some of the things I'm seeing on LinkedIn and other platforms where you can take some online courses so you can build skills because we are also at this fascinating time in the workplace of the Great Recession and people having and I think feeling more empowered about choices that they make in their professional life. And there are definitely platforms and organizations that are meeting that moment. Yeah, because also you have to maintain engagement with people yeah. in order for them to stay, right? And that means yep. showing that you care about me and that you want to develop me mm-hmm. and that you're not just, I'm not just a number, right? <laughs> in addition to everyone else that's already there. Well, absolutely. And I, and that really speaks to some of the opportunities for leaders now. And that is to figure out how do we start to tune in to the needs of our teams? Um, I do believe that this is one of the blessings from COVID. Um, COVID has been horrible for so many different reasons and devastating for so many people around the, around the world. And at the same time, there have been opportunities. And I think this has also held up a really powerful mirror for leaders to say, how am I leading? Can I lead the same way in person um, as, I did, as, I, as I do over Zoom? What has to shift? And how do I start to really see and hear and listen to the people that are on my team because I I am of the mind that that is more powerful than any paycheck. People want to feel seen. They want to feel heard. It doesn't mean that we always get what we want, but there's an ability to participate and join the conversation and to share ideas. And when that's in place, you have a culture and you have a workplace that people are excited to come to. They're like, hmm, I get to play. I get to grow. When we have leaders who are seeing something in ourselves that we don't necessarily see, and they are calling us to that higher place and saying, Sue, you might be the person to tackle this. Let's figure out how to learn. It just, it builds confidence. It builds visibility. um, And it helps every organization, whatever your expertise, whatever your area of expertise is, to meet those goals and that mission and that vision. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's just so fascinating to me that we as you know, corporate America, if you will, or mm. even in education, I think there's just so many opportunities to really highlight people who are doing great things but may not have the ability or know how to talk about that yet. I was just talking to a former uh, manager of mine, and he's working with a new company now, and he found this woman who is – as he calls her, like she was hiding in a corner somewhere, basically, but Mm -hmm. so talented, right? No one had seen the gifts that she has. And he kind of lifted her up and started talking about her and sharing the things that she's doing. And now she's, you know, doing videos on LinkedIn. She's doing all kinds of things. And I don't know if that would have happened for her if he hadn't, you know, said, I think she's got some potential here. Let's not waste it. Well, and isn't it, isn't it really all about amplifying other voices too and, and holding mm-hmm. each other up and saying, this person has something important to say and creating space and amplifying that voice and that perspective? Yeah, yeah I just think it's a gift that uh, all leaders have an opportunity to take advantage of and mm-hmm. not feel, I think sometimes um, some leaders will feel threatened by other really high potential people and may not Uh, allow them to shine because of insecurity. And so I think the more we can help people see that everybody can have a voice, right? It doesn't have to be me or you. It can be me and you. And how we can leverage those perspectives and, you know, experiences and the skills that we all have and come together for probably a better situation in the end on projects and the work that we're doing. Absolutely. And I... 
as I'm listening to you, two different, two different <laughs> words came to mind. One was scarcity and one was abundance. And it's that yes. whole idea of that scarcity mindset, right? And that, that happens for so many leaders and so many different people. It's sort of like, I have to hold on to what I have because if someone might outshine me, then I might be less than or lose my position or lose my role. And at the same time, when we pause and realize that great ideas make us all better, a great idea around the table means that our finished product can maybe be more creative, more innovative, serve our clients and our constituents in a better, higher level way. So it can be and it doesn't have to be the either or. It doesn't have to be the I am the leader and someone is on my team and um, and I need to kind of tamp them down a little bit and, and, and be in that space. What I can do is actually say, come to the table, elevate them, highlight them, because that's what really authentic, effective, dynamic leaders do. They're bringing all those voices to the table. And truthfully, as we think about kind of visibility, like that's how leaders show up. They show up in a way that says, this is important to me. They show up in a way that says, I want the best people around my table to be able to help me do the best work and find the best solutions. And it actually is a really big win for them, right? When they have great team members and they're showing those great things, it's a good reflection on them, you know, for being a good developer, for finding talent, Mm -hmm. promoting those people. I, I just always think it's a it's a sad thing when I see people not taking advantage of the good team members that they have and and really elevating them. So, okay, so let's transition into burnout and recovery. So let's talk about what are you doing for people, whether that that be in education or in leadership, to really help them move past that or even identify that they're going through it. They may not even know that. Beautiful question. I think the first piece is starting to slow down and recognize and realize where we are and how we're feeling. Um, because what's the tendency in so many professionals is to stay in motion, right? It's to just keep going and to keep moving to, from this thing to the next thing. And we sort of go from A to B to C to D. And when we start to slow down and look in that, in that broader perspective around our lives and look at and ask ourselves powerful questions. Is how I'm functioning sustainable? What is the toll that it's taking on myself, mind, body, and spirit? How is how I'm functioning impacting myself and my relationships and how I show up at work? So part of it is really being open to looking inside and figuring out what's going well and and identifying those places where we have that compulsion to just keep going and pushing. Part of the work that I do with all of my clients, both one-on-one and that I talk a lot about in workshops, is creating that sustainable foundation. Because if we have a... It's, think about it in terms of building a house. If you have a solid foundation, that house is going to be ready to go. If you've built the foundation on sand and it is unstable, then you are running that risk on a daily basis of something tipping and something falling and not having and not having solid footing. So part of it and a big piece of the work is creating that foundation. And we really look at that through establishing and kind of locking in health promoting activities of sleep and movement and nourishment and adventure and play and hydration um, and our relationship with technology. That's the place where we start. Um, because when that, when we're standing on solid ground and we are rested and nourished and clear headed and focused, everything else gets better and gets easier. I love that. I use the house analogy all the time with people too, because, uh, you know, even as you're stepping into becoming a leader, you need a strong foundation of who are you? What kind of leader do you want to be? All those types of things too. So I love that you're helping them. I think sometimes a metaphor helps, right? If you can see and think about a house, you wouldn't want to be living on a something that's going to fall out from under you at any point. (laughs) Right. Uh, You know, the other thing that came up for me when you were talking about that is that people have a choice as to whether or not they do keep Mm. busy, right? But I think that they don't realize that because society or culture or their family, you know, may have Mm -hmm. influenced them and give them, gives them beliefs that you have to work really hard, which is part of what I talk about in the book. Working really hard is great. 
not saying don't work hard. Mm-hmm. Not saying just don't do it so much that you kill yourself and don't do it so much that you're not sharing what you're doing. Absolutely. I think another important piece to to really look at is um, is truthfully a lot of that programming that comes into us at a very early age, right? What were the messages early in life that you got about work and about rest and about play? Um, what were what were the examples that surrounded you in your house and in your neighborhood and in your community about, um, you know, were people working two and three jobs in order to pay the bills? Were people um, always working on the weekends? Was there any free time on the weekends? Was there free time on in the evenings? Because we have so many messages around us. You know, I think about um, some of those mantras about, you know, hard work pays off and I'll sleep when I'm dead. And um, I mean, just, and they're powerful and we, and we can, right. And we can chuckle about them now, but in that moment, like you start to think about it, like, oh, huh, okay. <laughs> yes. And then it's a lot. we start to see how those early messages have really rooted inside of ourselves and impacted and shaped what is my vision of success? What is my definition of success? Does success mean following in the footsteps of those early examples around me where someone worked two or three jobs? Um, does success mean that a parent is always away because they are providing? What does success look like, look like? So when we start to, again, slow down so we can actually think about it, we can it becomes easier to, to understand that we do have choice and that there is agency there because it is easy to, it is so easy to buy into this is happening to me, right? Like, Oh sure. This is just the culture and, and this is all happening to me when in fact we have that decision to make about whether or not we buy into it and to what extent and to where our boundaries are with, I love this company. I want to be part of it. I know that I do good work. And at the same time, I'm not willing to work 80 hours a week. So we have that agency and sometimes we need time and space to think it through and to figure out how to start to honor ourselves and to give ourselves permission to say no and decline invitations and set boundaries. I love that so much because I was just talking to someone this morning who said, you know, there's so many hours in the day to work and I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead. She basically said that this morning. So it's so funny that you just said that. Um, That's what kind of made me chuckle. It's like, oh my gosh, I just heard it from someone this morning who feels like that is the option. I think there's just Mm -hmm. so many opportunities for people to slow down. And I know for myself Mm -hmm. back when I was in corporate, it just wasn't something I even considered. I, you know, wasn't working with a coach really yet at that point. And I didn't understand the importance of slowing down to be able to speed up, right? To have some time to think and be creative and be more strategic. Mm-hmm. And if you're not slowing down, you're just you're just going 90 miles an hour and you can't make good decisions yeah. or be there for your family, to your point. And isn't it interesting how when we change our pace, the quality of our work gets better. There are less errors in what we do. Um, we stand a much higher rate of success of like having to do something once then doing it really quickly when we're trying to multitask when we're busy 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 up against that deadline and then you look at it and you're like ooh i need to revise that and so it's so interesting because we live in this culture of go 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 produce meet the deadline check the box do all these things and what serves us the best to do the best work um to have the best ideas to come up with the most innovative solutions is if we slow down, put multitasking to the side and give ourselves time and space to let those ideas percolate, to have conversations, to have those building conversations where somebody says, Ooh, I love this. And now what? And we get to tease out that wisdom that exists within others and with people around our table. And that takes time, but that time is so much better spent than locking ourselves in our offices, home office or office outside of the house, and just putting our head down and grinding. And as you went through those last two answers, what I was thinking about, as you mentioned, boundaries, mm. a little bit about procrastination. Yep. You know, I hear, hear some people pleasing in there, which are like all the imposter syndrome types that I talk about in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you seeing that teachers and people in education are having similar experiences as like, especially I'm sure you're seeing and I'm seeing with leaders in corporate, are they going through that same thing? 
Absolutely. There are, there are parallel experiences, right? I think everyone's shopping in the same aisle. We might be in different supermarkets, but we're shopping in the same aisle with some of these beliefs that hold us back with some of these of our own compulsions about work and availability and needing to define what a leader is and buying into what everyone else says a leader is. You have to be available all the time. You have to be the first one in and the last one out. You must have all the answers. And it does feed into this desire to please others. Um, And the people pleasing piece definitely shows up a lot in educators. It showed up with me when I was in the, when I was in um, different administrative offices at different times feeling like, Oh my goodness, I have to make sure that this is, you know, that this unfolds in this specific way, or I'm going to be a failure. And it wasn't necessary. And it wasn't really about me. And I made a lot of things and I over personalized so much. Um, and that, really was was highlighting for me some of the work I needed to do about boundaries because it wasn't about trying to please everybody else. It was about trusting myself, knowing that I could do it, knowing that I was thoughtful, knowing that I had not only my institution's mission and vision, but the student's best interest at heart and weighing those out. So there's a lot of, yeah, same aisle, different supermarket. You, you are, are going to be my there. queen yep. of metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> you, there you go. Yep. You got some really good ones there that is just very <laughs> simple for people to follow and understand. Mm. So I love that you talked about trusting yourself. I also talk about that too because, you know, the more you can trust yourself, you stay out of comparison. You don't worry about what everybody else is doing and you kind of just go on your path. It's not to say you're not getting input from people, but it is important to start to build that confidence in yourself and realize that you do have the right answers if you just slow down Mm -hmm. and think about them and listen to your intuition a bit and say, you know what, I, my gut is telling me this might be the right way to go and I think we should try it instead of waiting for everyone else to to give in their input all the time. Mm -hmm. Agree. And compare and despair can be really easy, right? It's easy to jump into that place of what would she do? What would he do? What would they do? How would they solve it? And, and then to have that be the deciding factor. And when we trust ourselves, when we trust our judgment, when we trust our instincts, it allows things to become really, really clear. And all of the noise quiet and all of the things that are swirling around us soften and slow down. And I think part of it is that's the pathway to being more visible, right? When we trust ourselves and when we're not worried about if someone disagrees with us um, or if someone has is really pretty strong in their disagreement with us or if somebody thinks we're a little bit off base or thinks that we've lost our mind a little bit and why would we say that? When that doesn't drive our decisions, when, when that comes from our internal compass and truly trusting who we are and what we're about and what our intentions are, everything else gets easier because we've also taken our power back. It isn't about if somebody's going to like a post that I share. It isn't about how much engagement I'm going to get. It isn't about what the bottom line is. It's about do I feel comfortable and confident in the work that I'm doing? Am I in alignment? Do my words and actions, are they, are they in synchronicity? Am I in my own integrity? And when that's, when that's what we lead with, then amazing things happen. And we draw people to us who are also in that place. Absolutely agree with you because I just feel like I lived in a world of comparison and all of those things that I thought I was supposed to be right. And probably thought my team should be. And over time, after I left, it just gave me such a different perspective. So I would love for any of the listeners to realize the importance of trusting yourself because it does help you build your own confidence, help you make stronger decisions, and it helps you be a stronger leader for your team and your organization when you do that. And to know that, to know that you're not alone in, in that compare and despair, in some of that questioning. I think In those quiet moments when we all get really honest with ourselves, we're all on this journey of trusting ourselves. And we all have those days where it just feels like, yes, of course, and things just unfold really beautifully. 
And we all have those days and those moments where we're kind of like, eh, I don't really know about this. And we start to question. And it's not about all of a sudden never questioning yourself, but it is about being able to notice when we get into those thought loops and in those patterns of like, hmm. I'm having, I'm having some of those really insecure moments right now. This is what's showing up. Is this where I want to be? If, if it is, great. Sit in it. Wow, this is not where I want to be because this feels terrible. Okay, what kind of tools do I have that can help me move through it? Do I contact my mentor? Do I outreach to my coach? Do I talk with a trusted friend or colleague and just say, I am in one of those places where I am <laughs> doubting everything that I am about? Because also... When we talk about it, like that monster mm-hmm. gets really, it gets smaller and we take its power away when we start to notice it and name it and talk about it with other people. So if someone is going through burnout, what would you say are like the top three signs that mm-hmm. they should look for to say, okay, I guess this is more than I realized. I actually am in burnout and I didn't even know it. Another great question. My goodness. Um, I would say the first one would be, um, have you, have you lost your joy and that feeling of like, that feeling of lighting yourself up about what you do when, when we get to a place where a part of our life, it could be in our relationship. It could be in how we, and how we serve our community. It could be in our professional life where something that you used to love that lights you up now feels dimmed and now feels kind of like, Eh, it's kind of a cloudy sky and it's consistently cloudy. When we lose that joy, that is a powerful message that we need to translate. I would say another one is starting to really reflect on um, where is our level of patience and compassion and grace for ourselves and for other people. Um, If we find ourselves typically pretty patient and able to be thoughtful and compassionate. And we suddenly have a shorter fuse, right? And the things that we used to be able to kind of roll through and walk through now start to flip that switch and pluck that nerve of like, "Mm, that is not sitting well. Um, That's an indicator from mind, body and spirit that something needs attention. I would say the third one that I see in so many of my clients is Honestly, it's that over-personalizing everything, feeling like everything is their fault and that they're a failure. And we get to a place of, of someone can say, you know, maybe not say hello to us in the hallway and suddenly it's because we're a bad person because somebody didn't look at you and say hello. And all of a sudden that becomes personal. So our ability to take some space and our ability to be objective goes from a lot of space to just this minuscule little thing. And we're like, Oh, no, it's all about me. And typically when it becomes about us, it becomes about our faults and our failures. And we start this internal dialogue of you didn't do it well enough. You can't do this. You're a failure. Who do you think you are for trying? And those are probably, those are the things that I see most often at the top three things that I see in most of my clients. So what advice would you give to someone who is starting to feel that? What should their steps be to at least spend some time getting quiet? Are there things that you recommend to people like resources? Other than working with you, of course, um, that would be a good choice, right? I think there there are lots of different places to go for for support um, and lots of different ways to start to approach it. The first one, um, I would say one of them is Find somebody, find that trusted person in your life and start to talk about it. If you, if you are someone who is in therapy, talk to your therapist about it. If you, if you are somebody who's an advocate for therapy, which I am, find yourself a therapist. Find someone in your life or find a therapist that you can talk with about it and just be able to start to take some of the pressure out of your internal pressure cooker. Because... When we are at that place of burnout, it feels like no one else is going to understand and we feel completely isolated. And the more that we internalize it, the more isolating we feel, the more isolated we feel and the more isolating we become in our own lives. So find somebody to just say, wow, I'm I'm having a hard time. Or when someone actually says to you, hey, how are you? Give them that honest answer and say, I'm really struggling. 
and start to talk about it. I would say the next important thing is there are so many different coaches and groups and platforms that can offer support and resources. Um, you can Google. This is a place where Google is a great tool if you want to start to learn a lot about burnout. I love Thrive Global as an organization for a lot of the research that they have done around burnout and for a lot of the articles that they publish around workplace and culture as an easy way to just start to learn a little bit about it, hear from other people, understand that you're not the only person who is really struggling with this and who has and who's trying to figure out how to walk through it. The next thing that I would say is give yourself grace, even though it can be really hard. Um, and that means when you're tired, get rest. It means starting to figure out ways to listen to the messages from your mind and your body that are coming to you. Um, one of the first pieces of work that I do with all my clients is starting to become this 007 and decode all the messages that are coming from mind, body, and spirit. And you start to look at, is this connected to sleep? Is this connected to um, exhaustion? Is this connected to, you know, my own inner dialogue? So start to slow it down and start to get really curious about what those messages are. Great advice. And I think it's the reason I wanted to have you share some of that is not only for people as individuals, but also for leaders who may have some of that happening on their team to start to recognize some of the signs that their team may be going through. I think that was always something I was very mindful of, especially with the number of hours we are working. Is everybody doing okay? You know, trying to keep them as healthy as possible, obviously, and giving them time to, to get out and do something fun and get away from everything. So I love that you shared all that. Okay, so now let's talk about your book. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that I would you love just to. had coming out. So tell everybody about your book, um, how you got involved in this collaboration, yeah. and what it's about, who it's for. Um, it's a really exciting time for me. And I was invited to be a co-author in a book series. Um, I was invited to be part of it in March, and it just came out uh, about a month ago. The series is called Cracking the Rich Code, and it is this is volume eight that just came out. And each volume is this collection and this chorus of voices from all kinds of different people doing all kinds of different work. There are entrepreneurs, there are CEOs, there are marketers, there are coaches, there are therapists, there are um, project managers, there are financial folks. And every edition is this collection of essays, if you will, sharing insights and wisdom and strategy. Some of it is a very personal journey that people are sharing. Some of it is very much when I was in this position as a project manager, here were some of the pitfalls that I experienced and here's how I worked through it. And every single chapter, you will find nuggets and kernels of wisdom that you can apply. And it's not just for business people. It isn't just, oh my goodness, I must be an entrepreneur to read this. Nope. There are essays in there and there are <laughs> nuggets that people can apply if you, are, um, if you are a therapist, if you are working, if you are not working. So it's chock full of wisdom. And I said yes to the opportunity because of the energy about being, being with this joint venture, being part of something that was much larger than myself um, and being... Well, having the opportunity to add my voice to a conversation about how we're leading and how we're living. So it's been really exciting. Um, it's been climbing the charts on Amazon. It's an international bestseller in four countries, Australia and the UK and Canada and the US, and it's climbing the charts in all of these categories. So we're super excited um, with the success that it's having and that people are not only getting a copy of the book, but starting to really pull out those different pieces that they can bring into their life. So it's, uh, it's been a pretty exciting summer. Oh my gosh. Well, congratulations. That is amazing. Thank and you. I talked to you before it came out. So yeah. I think it's so impressive that you are a part of that and adding your voice and amplifying the things that you see uh, that may be very different than what other people see. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the series? So each series, each book in the series has different 
contributors, different people writing yes. things, right? And di- is it different themes? Um, it's all, there are, um, every person writes about a different topic. And so there are usually between 20, maybe 22, 23 authors in every volume. There are different authors. There are a couple authors who have appeared in, um, in two different volumes, but typically it is new authors every time. And they are coming from, and every different edition has kind of a broader cross-section of professionals. So people are coming from so many different industries um, and with different life experience and work experience. The series really came about as an idea between Jim Britt and Kevin Harrington, who are entrepreneurs, who are speakers, who are really talented business people, and their desire to amplify voices and to find ways to bring these kernels of wisdom and publish them and make them available to a broader audience. So that was also a part of it that was really exciting for me to be able to link arms with other entrepreneurs. Um, There's a bunch of coaches in this, um, in this edition as well. And we're all at different places in our own business journey. And just to be able to say, let's support each other. Let's, let's speak from the heart. Let's speak from what we know and let's support each other and put this out into the world. I mean, I love that they, you know, they could work with anybody, right? And they are choosing purposely to amplify new authors, voices that may not get the opportunity to get amplified without maybe some of their celebrity and their influence and all of those things. I think that's, that's really amazing. Yeah, it's been, again, really fun. I think when, when the invitation came to me, I had that moment of like, really excited, but I could definitely feel varying sizes of butterflies in my belly going, oh my goodness, do you, do you, do you, do you want to do this? Do you not? And I took a little bit of time and just got really quiet. And when I did that, it was so clear that being part of this felt right. It felt like it was the time for me to talk about some of the pitfalls that I had experienced in my leadership path. Um, my chapter is about escaping the leadership ta- uh, escaping the leadership path, my journey to and through burnout. So I talk a lot about my own path to being a leader and figuring out what that looked like, figuring out most importantly, what that looked like for me. Um, so there was some compare and despair in there and there's people pleasing in there and there's work on boundaries in there. And there's a lot of the inner work about who I am and what my value is as a human and what I can bring to the table. So it was also a great opportunity and invitation for me to say, step into a whole lot of vulnerability and put it out there. I mean, that's the first step, right? (laughs) Being willing to do that um, because your story is going to resonate with educators and leaders all over knowing that you went through that and came out the other side uh, much stronger for going through it. And everybody has their own journey and there's no right way to do it, right? Everybody has to get to where they're getting to or where they're going to go to in the best way for them. And so the more that you can Mm -hmm. help people with your own story, I just think it's, it's very inspirational. Thank you. It was, um, fun to write, a little bit daunting, you know, like, hmm, how much does one share? Hmm, do we tell this story? <laughs> hmm, I don't know. Yeah. I and, I think that, it's, yeah. and I think it's inspired me to, to continue to write. Um, I'll be interested and curious to see what feels like the next right thing for me to, for me to craft. Um, yep. Well, you take that time and slow yeah. down and think about it. And Absolutely. It's going to come out of you, I yep. think, for sure. <laughs> I think we'll all be the better oh. if you do. If you put something out else out in the world, I just think it's going to be a positive. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Okay. We are going to transition into what I call the rise up and shine visibility tips. So I'm going to ask you for kind of quick fire questions and would love to hear your responses, especially with your background and the things that you have experienced. The first one, Visibility is? Visibility is both internal and external. Internally, it is showing up and embracing who we are. Externally, visibility is leading with what's real, 
and bringing our full self to the table and showing up outside of ourselves with the stuff that's great, the junk that we all have, the places where we feel really confident and those places where we know that we need to pay attention. I love that. Imagine if we all did that, right? And stopped worrying about what everyone on social media was doing, (laughs) our neighbors, Mm. and we just got to be who we really are at our genuine, authentic selves. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier. An awful lot of pretty amazing things would happen and probably pretty quickly. (laughs) We can do it. I would, I would love to link arms with you and with anybody else who is, feels really ready to do that and to take it on. It would be amazing. Okay. The next question, do you have advice or a tip that you could share with the listeners on what you have done to be visible? I would say it's about speaking from the heart. I would say it's about, um, being that authentic self and pressing the mute button on that inner dialogue that says, is somebody going to like it? What are they going to think? Are they going to support it? Will they challenge me? Because it isn't about competing with other people. It's really about supporting other people. And it honestly loops back to this idea of scarcity and abundance, right? There's enough for everyone. For whatever you do, there's enough. So when we know that there is enough for everyone, it's easier to show up because we step away from the competition and the comparison and the, we both have the same kind of business, so we have to beat each other. No, there is enough for every person's business to be successful, period. I think I I probably experienced that in the beginning when I didn't really know, you know, about coaching enough and I didn't know how to be an entrepreneur enough. And I remember someone I met with said, Sue, there's 8 billion people on the planet. I'm sure you'll find somebody who wants to work with you, right? Yeah. (laughs) But it feels daunting at the beginning. I just, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Well, honestly, it can feel terrifying at the beginning because there's this moment of, of will anyone want to, who will? And at the same time, part of it is I am not a great fit for everybody. Like I am not. And that's okay because The clients that I might draw to me may not be a good fit for two other coaches, but they may see me and go, yep, I want that honesty. I want some of that sarcasm. I want that humor. I want that approach. I want that ability to reflect. And we're not going to be a good fit for everybody, but we are a great fit for some people. Yeah. And that comes back to speaking with some transparency and vulnerability Mm -hmm. and being your authentic self, because that is what resonates with the people who are supposed to work with you and are meant to. Yeah, absolutely. And a piece of that is also, um, you know, what's interesting is when people see my content and see things that I post and then they talk to me, they're getting the same person. I mean, there's not this, there's not this disconnect of here's your writing voice and here's how you sound. And like, here's what happens in a conversation. Like they're getting me there. There's not this gap. And that can be a stumbling block for an awful lot of people who have other folks like writing their content or people like starting, you know, conversations on the phone. And they have these really, sometimes for people have these really elaborate funnels and they talk to two to three people before they talk to, you know, the person that they would work with. And there can be this gap between this is like your, this post that you wrote is what drew me to you. And then I'm talking to you and I'm pretty sure it's not the same person. So it's, it gets to that alignment, right? It gets to that, this is who I am and this is what I can offer. This is how I can serve you. And this is what you get from me. And they're the same person. It's a lot, also a lot easier to just be the same person in both places, honestly. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're like, oh, I have to manage all these different things. Like that just seems exhausting to I, me. I like, did that in corporate for way too many years. I wasn't going to do that in this world that I was in now. Yeah. So. Okay. You are not alone in having done that. Yep. You are not alone. <laughs> yes, we nope. all have been there, done that, right? <laughs> okay. yeah, absolutely. So, and this feels better. Uh, mm. Yeah, and it's so much less stress and pressure. And yeah, absolutely. Right? Okay, absolutely. next question. What is the one piece of leadership or career advice that you received that helps you the most? Mm. I would say that um, what's right is not always popular. Um, doing the right thing means that sometimes you are going to find people who will absolutely 
disagree with you. And I had the absolute privilege to serve some incredibly talented heads of school. And the two that really stand out for me were people who who did the right thing and who made the really difficult decisions. Knowing that some people would be really excited about it. Others would be kind of neutral and numb and others would be viscerally opposed, but they got the, they got the best information from the people that were around them. They trusted themselves and they made the decision that was, that was appropriate for that time. And that took me a long time to get to that place because it was easier to just kind of go along and get along. But when we do that, we don't have the stress. We don't have the second guessing. And I wanted more of the decreased stress and less second guessing. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. You know, I think uh, I definitely had to be the one that stood up and said no uh, to many things, or Mm. even the person who said, yes, we're going to go. And maybe it wasn't a popular decision by others. And the more you can do that, I just think it builds such confidence even if it doesn't go well, Absolutely. right? You still learn from it and you still can apply those yep. learnings for the next time to do something mm-hmm. maybe a little bit different. But I, I don't know. I just remember those moments of, okay, you're going to have to be the only one to say yes here or the only one to say no. Yep. And it's a little scary <laughs> to be that person, oh, yeah. but it's good for your yeah. team to see that they have a leader who's willing to do that as well. It helps them know that they mm-hmm. can do it in the future. Yeah. It inspires everyone who is around you. Mm-hmm. And it helps you giving yourself permission to either be the only yes or be the only no it gives other people permission to do that as well. Mm-hmm. And when that's in place, the culture gets stronger and people do better work and everything, everything gets better and healthier. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so what is a book that you would recommend to the listeners that you love or have read re- recently? That's hard because I have been diving into a bunch of books this summer. Um, one that I recently read is, um, it's called Heartland by Sarah Smarsh. And I heard about her um, through, a, through a program in Oregon called Select Books. And she speaks so eloquently about poverty in this country and what it looks like and hardship and growing up in, in a specific family system that looked really different from a lot of other people and growing up in a transient, in a transient family and feeling really isolated when she got to college and finding her way and finding her voice. And it was beautifully written and really starts to amplify what the economic disparity and the economic gaps are in this country. So it was, um, it was a very powerful read for me. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for recommending. I haven't heard of that one. So I will make sure that we have the links to that book in the show notes. How would you like people to get in touch with you if they would like to learn more about you and your work and just connect with you? Absolutely. Um, People can find me on LinkedIn Um, you can find me by just searching my name and you can find me there. I love um, bringing more people into my network and my ecosphere in that place. You can find me on Facebook as well. You can also visit my website, which is rootetorisecoaching.com. And that's an opportunity to learn a little bit more of the programs that I offer and an opportunity to join my community and get my newsletter. So you can start to hear from me more regularly above and beyond what's out there on different platforms. Well, amazing. Thank you so much for joining on the show. I think there's just so many things that we've talked about today that are going to help people, especially if they are in this place of burnout and may not know it or are trying to find a way to work through it. Um, I wanted to thank, um, she's going to be listening to this, Denise Morrison, for connecting us Mm -hmm. because I think she is connecting me with some wonderful, amazing people to be on the podcast, and you are one of them. So I'm so thrilled that you were here today and really appreciate all of the honesty and, and genuineness that you shared with everything. It's been it's been a pleasure. This has been such a fun and enjoyable conversation for me. And also a shout out to Denise, who is a wonderful human, a very talented coach, someone who's doing great work, um, someone whose heart and, um, and integrity and compassion and work that I really admire. Thank you so much, Sue, for this opportunity. 
I'd love for us to, I want us to stay connected because I know there's a lot of ways that we can be amplifying each other and supporting each other in supporting our clients and other people to be courageous, to be seen, to lean into those places that feel a little bit angsty and butterfly filled. um, And through that path to really figure out who we are and to function at our highest and best. I would love that. I think there's just so many things, so many things that we talked about today that just really show how aligned we are on a lot of stuff that we're working on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And all the listeners will get to hear from Denise uh, soon. She's going to be on the show too. So they'll get to hear all about the great things that she's doing out there too. But thank you so much for joining today, Nicole. Thank you to all the listeners. Uh, I'm not sure if you are out on LinkedIn today, but I posted that this podcast is now in the top 10% globally based on listen notes. And I was just so excited because we just started at the beginning of March. So that just says all of the good things about the guests that we've been having on, but also the listeners who are downloading it. And so I just wanted to thank you all. I hope you get to hear this. Uh, If not, you'll hear it soon. I'll talk more about it, but I'm just very, very grateful for everybody who has been in any way connected with this and helped me get it off, especially Sheep Jam Productions, who produces this podcast and helps me in so many ways. And I'm so grateful to all of them as well. Thank you so much for joining today on the Visibility Factor podcast, and we will talk to you next time. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Visibility Factor podcast. Remember that visibility starts with small steps that are intentional and consistent each day. Be bold, be visible, be the leader you were meant to be. Find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Follow us on all of our social media platforms, which are highlighted in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Visibility Factor podcast.